Today I want to talk with you about intracranial bleeds. Intracranial bleeds can be divided into two categories. The first category is extraaxial bleeds and the second category is parenchymal bleeds. Extraaxial bleeds can further be divided into epidural bleeds, subdural bleeds, and subarachnoid bleeds. Parenchymal bleeds include hypertensive bleeds and those bleeds are in the brain parenchyma. Let's talk about the meninges, the covering of the brain. The brain is covered by the meninges. The meninges consist of three layers. The first layer is the pear mater this covers the brain. The second layer is the arachnoid mater. This is in close proximity to the pia mater. The third layer is the dura mater. The outer surface of the dura mater adheres to the inner surface of the skull. In addition, the outer surface of the dura mater anchors into the suture lines. There is both an epidural space, which lies between the skull and the dura, and the subdural space, which is the on the surface of the dura. The subdural space is between the dura and the arachnoid. The epidural space is restricted by the suture lines while the subdural space is an unrestricted space within each hemisphere. It is important to remember that the epidural space is a restricted space, the subdural space is an unrestricted space, and the subarachnoid space communicates with all the ventricles and the fissures. Let's talk about the blood supply. The brain has two circulations, an anterior circulation and the posterior circulation. The anterior circulation starts with the internal carotid artery, which enters the base of the brain and gives off the anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral arteries. Both the right and left anterior cerebral arteries are connected by the anterior communicating artery. The posterior circulation starts with the two vertebral arteries which confluence to form the basal artery. The basal artery gives off the posterior cerebral artery while the posterior communicating artery connects the posterior cerebral to the internal carotid. The circle of Willis is formed by the anterior communicating anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, posterior communicating, and the posterior cerebral arteries. It is important to note that all the major vessels of the circle of Willis run in the subarachnoid space, while smaller vessels that branch off supply the brain parenchyma. The anterior cerebral artery supplies the medial frontal lobes. This part of the brain controls logical thinking, personality, and voluntary movements, especially in the legs. It also supplies the parietal lobes. The middle cerebral artery supplies the majority of the lateral hemisphere. Any occlusion to the middle cerebral artery would result in weakness in the contralateral face and arm. There would be speech disturbance such as aphasia and dysarthria. There would also be visual field effect such as amyanopsia. Finally, there would be inattention to stimuli and sensory deficits. The posterior circulation supplies the medial and inferior temporal lobes. It also supplies the occipital lobes.
Any deficit to the posterior circulation would result in visual field defects and sensory deficits. Let's talk about the vertebral basal system. If there is a problem with the vertebral basal system, this would result in dizziness, ataxia, impaired balance, pupils and eye movement abnormalities, changes in voice and problem swallowing, and alteration in the level of consciousness. Here is a schematic of the circle of Willis, and um, it has all the major vessels that was previously described. Let's talk about the epidural hematoma. An epidural bleed is a bleed that occurs when the middle meningeal artery is ruptured. Most epidural bleeds are associated with a skull fracture. It is an arterial bleed and it occurs in the restricted space known as the epidural space. These patients can present with headache, confusion, somnolence, respiratory depression, irritability, nausea, and vomiting, and asymmetric and large pupil. The patients may also have a lucid moment which progressed to a non-lucid state as the hematoma expands in the epidural space. It is important to know that while an epidural bleed does not cause a stroke, there will be some degree of focal deficit. Remember, this bleed is outside of the brain parenchyma, and if not treated by surgical evacuation, these patients can die. Here is a classic epidural bleed. Please take note of the elliptical shape of the hematoma. This particular shape is due to the limitation of the epidural space by the suture lines. The hematoma cannot push the skull out, so it pushes the brain parenchyma in. As the hematoma expands, it causes midline shift. The next thing we want to talk about is the subdural hematoma. Subdural hematoma is a result of rupture of the bridging veins in the subdural space. This represents 10 to 20% of all bleeds in head trauma. Subdural hematoma is commonly seen in the very young, such as in shaken baby syndrome, the very old due to atrophy, and in alcoholics due to thrombocytopenia. These patients can present with confusion, slurred speech, headache, problems with balance or walking, nausea and vomiting, weakness and vision problems. Here we have classic subdural hematomas. Please note that the subdural bleed is a crescent shape bleed in the unrestricted subdural space. If it is not found in the acute phase, it can become chronic at which time it is known as a hygroma. Note the midline shift that's occurring in these subdural bleeds. This is a classic example of a chronic subdural bleed and it is known as hygroma. In this case, it is bilateral. The next bleed we want to talk about is the subarachnoid bleed. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is seen in 40% of patients with moderate to severe head injury. Other cause may be due to the rupture of a aneurysm. It is associated with poor outcome scores at three months after injury. The bleed is occurring in the subarachnoid space where all the major vessels run. The bleed can be arterial, venous, or 
extension of intraparenchymal bleed, which penetrates the pia mater and spilled over into the subarachnoid space. An important feature of the subarachnoid space is that it communicates with the ventricles, the sylvian fissure, and the ambient cistern, so that a subarachnoid bleed will show up in these areas. These patients usually complain of the worst headache of their life. If left untreated, these patients will die. An important question that should be asked is, can a person have a subarachnoid bleed without having the worst headache of their life? The answer is yes. If a person has a slow bleed that seals and re-bleed, they may not present with the typical worst headache. Please remember that a subarachnoid bleed can either be an arterial bleed or a venous bleed. Here is a classic subarachnoid bleed. Note there is blood in the sylvian fissure. The next bleed is the parenchymal bleed. So far, I have spoken about the extraaxial bleeds, namely epidural, subdural, and subarachnoid. I will now show you a parenchymal bleed. A parenchymal bleed is occurring in the brain parenchyma and it is usually due to the rupture of a small supplying vessel. These bleeds usually occur in the basal ganglia and almost always result in a stroke. The neurologic deficits seen in a parenchymal bleed is determined by the size and location of the bleed. Usually, these persons have uncontrolled hypertension, are cigarette smokers, and cocaine users. Persons with a parenchymal bleed usually have vision problems, speech problems, gait problems, facial problems and weakness in the upper extremities. Here you have um, two parenchymal bleeds. Bleed number one is a right basal ganglia bleed that has invaded the right ventricle. The right ventricle is also compressed with a midline shift and edema in the occipital lobe. Bleed number two is also a basal ganglia bleed on the left side. In this case, there is no midline shift. I have completed both extraaxial bleeds and parenchymal bleeds. Just remember, extraaxial bleeds are occurring outside the brain, while parenchymal bleeds are occurring in brain tissue. I also want to mention that AV malformation is a vascular anomaly in which there are no capillaries. As a result, the high arterial pressure can cause a vascular rupture with subsequent parenchymal bleed. You have to be clinically in tune with the patient observe the patient, take a good history if possible, and do a good physical examination. Do not hesitate to get a head CT without contrast if you suspect an intracranial pathology. It is important to keep in mind that the person can still have an intracranial pathology with a normal neurologic examination. In such cases, the history and your clinical suspicion should guide you. Your documentation on everyone with intracranial bleed should include the Glasgow Coma Scale. 
Once a bleed is discovered, the patient should be stabilized and transferred to a hospital with neurosurgical capabilities. Here is the general approach to anyone who comes to the ER with possible intracranial pathology. Number one, check and secure the airway, breathing, and circulation. Number two, there should be IV placement with labs drawn. Number three, provide oxygen to keep the saturation greater than 92%. Number four, continued pulse oximetry and cardiac monitoring. Number five, do a physical examination, including a neurologic examination. And number six, there should be a non-contrast head CT and door to CT time should be 20 minutes or less on arrival to the ED. In the event that the CT is positive, the patient should be started on labetalol 10 milligrams IV push as needed and or hydralazine 10 milligrams IV push as needed and did as is to keep the systolic blood pressure less than 140 millimeters of mercury. The patient should also be started on nicardipine in, um, and it, those could be anywhere from 5 to 50 milligrams per hour and this is as needed. Manitol should be considered um, the dose is 0 0.5 to 1 milligram IV bolus and this is to prevent mass effect or herniation. Um, the same um, objective can be achieved by using hypertonic saline. Um, next, the patient should get a surgical, a neurosurgical consult and Finally, the patient should be admitted to the neuro ICU. Well, in closing, please remember the following. Number one, extra axial bleeds are outside of the brain parenchyma. Number two, parenchymal bleeds are in brain tissue. Number three, the neurologic deficits seen in a bleed is dependent on the size and the location of the bleed. Number four, a normal neurologic examination does not rule out intracranial pathology. And number five, most times the presence of intracranial pathology will manifest as eye problem, speech problem, or gait problem. Finally, thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe like and share. I wish you well. Good night.